is the book. This is a photograph of the mountain Arunachala, which was the which was the teacher of Sri Ramana Maharshi, and that this mountain became known through Ramana Maharshi. Um, this, the, the, the photograph is on the cover because um, I feel that this mountain has really transformed my life. I've been going to Tiruvannamalai, um, the city where the, this mountain is located, for the last... I started going there in 97, and I still go there every day, uh, every, sorry, every day, actually, yes. I'm there every day of my life, but I go there every winter uh, around Christmas time. That's a, a time where I'm able to go there. Um, maybe I'll, I'll speak a bit about how I came to do this book. I was, um, once upon a time, I was a, I was a lawyer. I was actually studying law at King's College in London. And um, I went on to study in Paris and graduated with an with a LLM in English and French law and then a master's in business law in Paris and passed the Paris bar and eventually I left to go to America and pass the New York bar. But after some time I got so, I felt so much freedom being in America, far away from my family and away from my background, I started really, especially after reading a book by uh, Joseph Campbell, The Power of Myth, I started following my own bliss. And that took me to uh, drawing, drawing classes, and, um, and yoga classes, martial arts. I got into marsh, uh, martial arts, especially Aikido, started studying Aikido with a passion. And uh, through Aikido, I met uh, a friend who introduced me to India and who introduced me to his teacher, teacher who was Muktananda, and also to some books that really changed my life, such as a book by Jiddu Krishnamurti, The Freedom from the Known. And that's when I realized that I'm not the mind, I'm not the body. That was an amazing discovery, and it made me really uh, excited about knowing more about it. Another book that was really essential in my life was uh, Chasm of Fire by Irina Tweedy, because it was really an example of the fire within, you know, how she sat by her teacher uh, and ready to go through the most intense suffering just to open her heart. And that for me was really, um, I saw that to open one's heart is not always easy. Um, I was always attracted to go to India, but it didn't happen until I was 30 years old. It actually happened by chance. I was, uh, I'd, I'd lost my job as a lawyer, and I'd I was still in New York, owner of an apartment. And because I lost my job, I got fired, pretty much, because I, I think I was doing too much artwork and too much martial art you know, for their taste. So I lost all my papers and uh, I became illegal. And so I was invited to go practice Aikido in Canada and went to Canada and when I came back, tried to come back into the country, I was stopped at the immigration, I was thrown out of the train, I couldn't come back to New York. So I decided, I didn't decide anything actually, I did what I could, I went, to, I went back to Montreal and asked a friend to put me up, which she did. And then my friend who had been instrumental in, in in uh, introducing me to the, to, to the wisdom of the great sages, he said, well, it's time for you to go to India. So that's exactly what, I, what happened. I went to Paris, and then I got ready to go to India. And while I was in Paris, as I was looking for a dojo to practice Aikido, I came across a lecture by a disciple of Arnaud Desjardins. Arnaud Desjardins is, is, is a, a well-known spiritual teacher in, Fran in France. And he's also well-known for the... For the black and white documentaries he's done on um, Eastern religion. Anyway, so his disciple was giving a talk about a sage, Ramesh Balsekar, <coughs> who's a disciple of Nisargadatta Maharaj. And since I knew I was going, to, I had decided to go to the ashram of Muktananda, I knew I was going to go to Mumbai, and so I asked uh, this journalist to give me the address of Ramesh Balsekar, and when I arrived in Bombay, I went to see Ramesh Balsekar, 
and uh, this is how I got into introduced into Advaita Vedanta. And Ramesh was an um, ardent reader. He was not only a, a disciple of Nisargadatta Maharaj, he was also an ardent reader of Ramana Maharshi since he was young, very young. And uh, so through knowing Ramesh, I was introduced to the teaching of Ramana Maharshi. And this was why I later came to Tiruvannamalai and to uh, the mountain Aru Natchala. Um, so this is how this... Well, yeah, the, the, the other thing I'd like to say also is that as I was exploring the visual arts, there, there's a time in 91 where I took a course in black and white photography at Parsons University, uh, printing photography. And um, I traveled to, that year I traveled to Haiti. And I took my first black and white photos. And when I came back with my teachers at Parsons, we developed the roles. And when they saw the contact sheets, they said, you've got to buy a Leica. You really have a gift in portrait photography. So this is how, how it started, as far as the photography is concerned. So that as I was seeking, I was seeking to find a teacher. I was seeking love, like all of us in this world. I think we're all seeking love. So I was seeking, uh, I was seeking love. So I was looking for a spiritual teacher, and I had my camera with me. I had my first. I had just a Canon, and very soon I bought a Leica camera. Actually, most of the portraits in the book, except for the first portrait, Ramesh's Bal Balzikas portrait, was not taken with a Leica camera, but all the others were taken with a Leica M6. So um, at first, I did not have the intention to make this book. I just took photos. The first portrait is the portrait of Ramesh Balsekar. Uh, I'd like to show it to you because it's important that the portraits be seen. I don't know. Tell me if you can see. Yeah. This is my very first portrait. It says it all. You know. It's a book you, you can read in Silence. The mind has to be quiet. This is the, the very first portrait. And then, then I, I traveled for the summer to, to um, France. I was still living in New York at the time. And uh, by, by chance, I met Douglas Harding, which is also one of the portraits I've taken, which is quite well known. Second portrait. And then the third portrait I took, or, or I don't know whether, yeah. Stephen Jourdain, who's very famous in France. I don't know if he's so famous here in. He, he, he's a prolific writer. He wrote a lot of. He, um, he woke up when he was 16. And finally, while I was in France, also known as Ama, Ama, who doesn't know Ama? And on seeing those five portraits, Arnaud Desjardins, who wrote the, the foreword of the book and who, who made many beautiful films on Eastern religion, he said he got this idea of making a book. So in 95, 96, the idea of this book uh, happened. Um, now I, I'd like to read a sentence of, uh, by Amma which summarizes what happened for me also. When I, start, when I embarked on this path, I, suddenly I realized that I only had one life, so I couldn't really go on being a lawyer. For me, it, it was, it was a bit, in a way a waste of time because I was not happy as a lawyer, and I felt, my God, this, I only have one life, and, and uh, I, I, want to, I, 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 don't, I really don't want to waste it, and slowly, I became really interested in just knowing, knowing about who am I 
and what is the purpose of my life, Wh what is the truth with a capital T. And later, when I read uh, all the sages that I met, the, the, their writings, they came back on, you know, the purpose of one's life is to get to know this truth. I, I'm just going to read uh, a sentence by, written by Amma right now. There is one perennial truth which remains unchanged beyond the passing of time. To realize this truth is the purpose of human existence. Life can be fulfilled only through this realization. So that was very clear to me, that however crazy for me it was to leave you know, financial security to search for love and to open my heart, because I had slowly, slowly had realized that um, I needed to, I was full of stress and full of conditioning, and I felt that my heart was closed. And so that's why I went to India. I said, India will help me to open my heart. And I, when I met one of my most important teachers, um, Yogi Ram Sarat Kumar, I bowed in front of him and I asked him, please, I cannot do it alone. I cannot take my heart out and open it. So please help me to open my heart. This is Yogi Ram Sarat Kumar. He, he talks about himself as the dirty beggar, but he's actually an incredible <coughs> yogi. He never really spoke to me very much. The first time I, I, I met him, he asked me to repeat his name. He says, do you know how, what's my name? I said, yes, Yogi Ram Sarat Kumar. And he made me repeat his name three times. And he said, well, whenever you need me, you just repeat my name. And then later, the next year, when I met him again, I, I wrote him a letter ex telling him a bit of my story. And that's when I told him to please help me to open my heart. And um, during that month, I was in Tiruvannamalai. This was one of the last year that Yogiji was giving uh, darshan, because he, was, it was, he, he passed away a year later on Shivaratri, actually. Uh, that's tomorrow, on February 20th. So. It's the anniversary of his, of his death tomorrow. Um, I, re I, I found out I was, I was pregnant. And I, I, uh, my son is, only, is today 14, but he was conceived in, in this holy place of uh, Arunachala. Um, I would like to show some more portraits, because that's what's most important. Um, I want to say I did, not meet, I did not meet all of the great sages in the world. I'm a human being, I'm limited, so I've traveled to Europe, I've traveled to India, and I've traveled to America. So I've met only, I'm sure, a limited amount of sages, but I went to Arunachala, and I met some amazing people, I have to say, so for this I'm, I'm really blessed. There is, um, let, let me see which one. There is one portrait I, I like very much, which was taken in Rishikesh of Swami Chidananda. Which it's one this portrait touches me a lot also. And and I also will also read the sentence because it's the same message. It's about finding God within ourselves. It says, The essence of Vedanta is your divinity. And the practice of Vedanta is to be constantly aware of your divinity. You are of the nature of Atman, Satchitananda, existence, consciousness, bliss. You are not what is seen as the outer person, which is only name and form, the, the apparent man or woman. Beyond this name and form, you exist as a radiant center of luminous consciousness. Attain this knowledge and become free. On my path to go towards this knowledge, what has helped me a lot is the practice of yoga. It's uh, b because I have a, a mind that tends to be always at work, and a lot of us have, I find it very necessary to have a form of practice that is either, you know, to 
go beyond the mind or to totally go into the feeling, the sensation of the body. And I was very lucky to meet in 97, through actually through making this book, I wanted to, I was looking to meet several teachers and I heard about through me meeting Francis Lucille, who's unfortunately Francis Lucille, who's a uh, uh, disciple of uh, Jean Klein, is not in this book because the portraits I took of him were not good enough to be in the book. Uh, I later, through Francis Lucille, I met Eric Barré, who's also a disciple of Jean Klein, and um, he said he didn't want to be in the book, but he let me photograph him. But most importantly, Eric Barré became my teacher in non-dual yoga, in, in uh, yoga from the tradition, the Kashmir tradition of, of yoga. And this yoga has really, really helped me. It's, it's a way to practice, which we, we, we think that to be spiritual is to, you know, be maybe in the head, but to be spiritual is to, to actually really also be in the body, really feel the body. Th this is the portrait of Eric Barré. I would also like to read a sentence. Oh no, this 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 photograph I would like to show. So this this is one of my, my favorite portraits. Ranjit, Ranjit Maharaj. It's a good portrait. Huh? There's also the Dalai Lama. More well known. It's a good picture of him. I met him in Dharamsala, and what is, was amazing about meeting the Dalai Lama is to see how we could go. With, 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 I was with a group, I was with Shanti Mai, who's an a, a American teacher, and, and we surprised him by, by singing the uh, Tibetan mantra, which he thought we didn't know. And as we were singing, he started crying, you know, from just, he was so touched. And the next thing, 10 minutes later, he was laughing. And then you see his expression here. Yeah. He's like a child. It's re really wonderful to watch the Dalai Lama. Um, I'd also like to show a portrait of Eckhart Tolle, who I met. It's more famous. And, um, This is a, a teacher around Arunachala. Her teacher was Punja. She, and she has very simple words. The text I chose for her is, remove the sense of being somebody. Just be. It sounds very simple. Arnaud Desjardins, earlier on, he, he wrote the, the foreword of, of my book. He was a, a filmmaker and also a teacher in France. He wrote many, many books. He's a prolific writer and he's very clear in, in his teaching. So he, he wrote, this God residing in heaven can only be discovered within ourselves. And what is heaven other, the in, other than the infinite unlimited space, free from all conditioning, from all attachment to anything other, other than the one, the ultimate reality. More than ever, we need to seek within ourselves, at the core of the most intimate. God is closer to you than your jugular vein, says the Koran. If we do not venture thus into experience, we can know everything about God, but we will not know God. To know is to be. Whether we be Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, or an adept of a less known tradition, or simply a well-meaning agnostic, 
the priority of priorities consists consist in rediscovering the being we are, the life of our life. Let us root ourselves in the certainty of experience, the only true basis of a genuine dialogue. We will, we will then know what, that what brings us together, what brings us together is much more important than what separates us. And I think this text is really, really important today, after what happened recently in Paris, you know. Je suis Charlie. Uh, it's very important for me to talk about this, to talk about the one that we are beyond all concepts of religious religion. And Adia Shanti, who is another teacher in the book, says that the true revolution will happen inside of us. And for me, this book is more important than it seems. This book really invites us to look inside and to make the revolution happen within us, because only if we know ourselves and maybe change ourselves, if you know, if, if there's something to change, can, can the world change? Only if we do our best can the world be at peace. Only if pe we have peace in our hearts as individual will there be peace in the world. Adia Shanti writes, the inner revolution is an awakening of an intelligence not born of the mind. It's not born of the mind, but of an inner silence of mind, which alone has the ability to uproot all of the old structures of one's consciousness. Unless these structures have, are uprooted, there can be no creative thought, action, or response. Unless there is an inner revolution, nothing new and fresh can flower. Only the old, the repetitious, the condition, will flower in the absence of this revolution. But our potential lies beyond the known, beyond the structures of the past, beyond anything that humanity has ever established. My own practice. My own practice. Um, I, in my life, I do not have so much time to practice in the sense of sitting down. Uh, because I'm a single mother, <laughs> but I'm a, I'm lucky that I'm an early riser. So the first thing I do in the morning is sit by the fire, sit on my yoga mat, and practice yoga. It's not a practice in. It's not a routine. It's just I sit on my mat. I sit on yeah. I sit on the mat, and the first thing I do is I observe the breathing. You know, breath. Actually, that, that's what I usually do when I do, a pre when I do a presentation around my book. The first thing I invite people to do is to just sit, which we can do maybe now, and feel the sensation of the legs touching the, the chair, and feel the sensations of the feet touching the floor, and imagining that the feet are like roots, rooting very deeply into the ground. So you imagine you know, that your feet are like roots of a tree going deep into the ground. And then you're standing straight, you know, just relax, that's what I do every morning. And relax the shoulders, the shoulders tend to often have a lot of stress. You know. And you imagine that the uh, upper body is like the branches of the tree and that it's you know aspiring to go into the sky and you imagine that the top of your skull is in touch with the sky in touch with the heaven so you go deep into the ground and you go high up in the sky and you observe the 
sensation of the body in contact with the, with the ground and with the chair. And at the same time, you observe the breathing. You, you breathe in, and then you breathe out. It's just like a wave. The wave comes in, and then the wave comes out. This is my practice in the morning. And then sometimes I pray also. I have my own prayers to Shiva. Or, but this is more intimate. So I, I teach yoga. So sometimes I don't have so much time for myself to practice yoga because I'm also a homeowner. Uh, but because I teach, I, at least I know that twice a week I will be going to my classes and there I'll be practicing with my students. Uh, it's an hour of non-dual yoga with postures and um, and Tai Chi Chuan. We do the form. Uh, what other form of practice do I have? Yes. Also to go at the root of the I thought, before before the I thought, to just remain still. And then, usually I realize that the mind is active again. So I catch it. And again, I stay at the point before the I thought. Th this, this I try to practice sometimes, yes. And when I'm busy, when I'm just busy all day having to move, to do the dishes, to, you know, deal with things, then often I sing. I sing bhajans, or I sing any song. Sometimes Edith Piaf, you know, Non, je ne regrette rien, or... This is... I practice, it's very important, because life is not easy. And sometimes life is even sad. And sometimes there's a lot of stress. It's important to do what you can to keep that joy inside. So m my way is, to si singing is a good way of uh, lightening the fire. Th th there's, there's a fire within. And you can make it bigger fire by practicing, whether it's yoga or just watching the breath or singing or um, thinking about your teacher This, this is the practice. Alan, do you think there's anything <coughs> else I should mention? Well, I think from what um, Dominica has said, you get the flavor of the book and how valuable it is. It's a treasure house of the great spiritual teachers of the world. Not only does the photograph catch their personalities, but you have also sentences which is the gist of their teaching. If one read the whole book, I reckon that um, enlightenment would almost follow because of the, the power and the strength of it. So it's a gold mine of, um, of sure spiritual you. wisdom. I show and another picture <laughs> of an Indian saint and I will, I will read one of her sentences. She says, every home is a place of worship Every resident, a priest or priestess, life itself is worship. <laughs>